Hi guys and gals, it's Pete from Mindwise Man's channel, aka Maverick Outdoors, and today is Saturday. It's a lovely sunny evening, the 18th of July 2015, and as you can see, I've actually set up my basher for the night. A little backwater riverbank that I've been to many times before. I set out this afternoon to have a little paddle along the Thames and have a little sort of nice little view of what's around. See all nature coming back to life during the summer months. I'm going to be knocking up some really nice trail food scoff and also I've got some kit in there and the reason being for bringing some of the other kit that I might not really have needed today and tonight uh, is the fact that I'm going to do a separate video on my wild camp sleep kit but I've actually brought the kitchen sink version of a cook stove <laughs> the Coleman two burner stove and the reason I've bought it is uh, basically for convenience. I've not actually brought it out on a wild camp. I've used it. I've had it since 1999. When I took it with me uh, in 1999, when I went down to St Ives and I was doing some trekking, camping in some farmland, and also doing a bit of sort of rock climbing. So uh, that kept us going for sort of three, four days. So I put it behind my seat in the canoe and um, thought I'd bring it with me just for some real convenience to actually cook up some food. Um, I was going to bring my firebox stove to have a nice sort of like, tactile flamey fire but the reason why I didn't is because access to some of the deadwood and firewood around here would have meant as you can see there's a lot of nettles and I'd have had to cut them back but actually um, for me it's a safety and security barrier because just over there where you can see the sky through the trees there's quite a bit of public access which is fine people sort of taking their dogs for a walk and also there's farm animals in the further distant so I thought you know I knew I was going to actually come to this location so if I was going to have to procure firewood it would have meant I'd have had to clear away all these nettles which would have actually opened up space and made it a little bit more accessible because there used to be a fisherman's path just right over there so that I could stay nice and secluded and private just in this nice little space um, that's why I've brought the dual burner and you'll see what I'm going to concoct up on it in a little while but anyway I'm really hungry now so I'm going to knock up some food and uh, empty that bag okay so I've got just over half a litre of water ready to boil up and make some soup starting off with a chicken stock cube which is going to boil up in there but tonight we're going to have as a starter crab meat and sweet corn soup yummy Chinese style some pre-chopped up spring onions for the finish some corn flour to thicken it up and some ginger and that's going to be all knocked up oh nearly forgot two eggs in there, one for breakfast tomorrow, but the white of an egg has to be carefully dribbled in so then you get the white egg effect as it finishes off cooking up. It only takes about 15-20 minutes, anyway I'm going to get it on the go. Crab meat and sweet corn soup, trail food, wild camping on a riverbank. Oh. <laughs> Taking it to the extreme! Used a wet wipe to clean over my hands and then to get rid of any grimy germs, especially after paddling on the waters and setting up the basher, what have you, with some antibacterial wipe and then dry my hands off with a paper towel. I'll always keep this on one of the D-rings on the rucksack.
ready now to mix the chopped ginger with the crab meat and also sherry. This is cream sherry, you can use pale sherry. The actual traditional ingredient would be rice wine. But uh, this comes up at the same flavour. The nearest thing to it that's easy access compared to uh, rice wine is sherry. So that's going to go in there and mix up. Taking that down to a simmer now. And then putting in the mixture of crab meat, sherry, and the ginger. Close the lid, get it out of the way so you don't cut your fingers on it. So that's got to simmer now for about 10 minutes. I've just opened the lid again because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make up the corn flour and water mixture, just a very small amount to thicken the soup. So I'll use about a teaspoon of corn flour. Although it's normally better when you're making a, a thickener using corn flour to use cold water, I'm going to use some of the soup solution and then just mix it up. If there's the odd little lump in it because it's used hot water, then um, that's not a problem. It's not to make it too thick and stodgy, it's just the right amount to sort of make it a bit more syrupy in texture. Textures just start to thicken a little bit. This is so convenient using this bit of kit. <laughs> I'm spoiling myself, five star. It's just really novel to use it. Normally if I was making one serving I'd get one of these small tins or sometimes even fresh sweet corn but it tends to be much sweeter and tender um, with a lot of tin sweet corn so normally I'd actually use about maybe half of these for one portion but I'm just going to stick the whole lot in maybe save a few for Akasha a couple of spoonfuls in there I'll save for Safari Dog Coming to the end of it now, it's not even been 15 minutes. Just letting that simmer through. But what I do do, or do do, is Chinese, traditional Chinese food, they'll use a lot of seasoning and sometimes sugar with a lot of their meals. So out of my tea bag and sugar container, I'm just going to put in about what would be a large teaspoonful. And in turn, it just heightens that sweet flavour, just that little bit more. Again, it's down to personal choice, really. Oh, yeah. Quality. So I've taken a large egg out of one of the egg containers. I'm going to crack it, separate the yolk and then take that away and then uh, put the egg white and just pour it in so it dribbles and makes ribbons as it's known in the Chinese trade
Absolutely. Chinese style yummy. Smoking. Once that's switched off, there's still a little bit of residue fuel vapours. Again, it's not coming out of the fuel tank anymore, it's just going through the tube. The pressure's gradually dying down and then that flame will naturally extinguish itself on the burner. Now I'm going to garnish with some spring onion, all chopped up. You can put the spring onion in the last sort of minute or two of simmering. But what tends to happen with spring onions, especially in this sort of dish, they can lose their tangy flavour if you actually cook them with the process of making the soup or any other meal for that matter. So they keep their flavour right at the end of cooking to then be actually added at that time. There you can see more of the texture and the colour scheme of the soup. I left it about five minutes once it all cooked through. The um, saucepan has cooled down around the edge. Obviously it's stainless steel so it tends to hold its heat for much longer. But round the edge for about half an inch to an inch I can drink out the saucepan so I can uh, down some of the liquid and then spoon some of the solids down my throat. Bring it on. The novelty is five-star restaurant type food in a place like this. <laughs> mm. Warming, tangy. And this is just my starter. I've got spicy, tangy Chinese pork with noodles and fresh vegetables. To cook on that, it's going to be just so convenient to use it. So I'm just going to relax and savour this soup, and then uh, in a little while, knock up my main course. But meanwhile, are you on the men's safari, dog? Yeah, you're right, Kash. You're all right. Yeah, you can't have none of this soup. You had a bit of sweet corn mixed with that dog food that comes in a little tray. It was like um, a pate, I think poultry and veg. And then just put sweet corn with it and she's eaten half of that. So, But yeah, she's getting on the mend at the moment. Aren't you, dog? You had life-saving surgery a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? Hey, you nearly didn't make it. But that's another story. We'll talk about maybe a bit later on. I'd mentioned recently about one of the techniques I use to clean my cooking utensils. Imagine if that had a bit of sort of burnt on residue from cooking other stuff, or if it was a mess tin, I've been frying some stuff. Just a little drizzle of water, not too much, maybe about half inch to an inch, let it boil through and it takes away any of the burnt on residue, helps to separate it, especially on stainless steel. I could have easily rinsed that out and just wiped it over with a kitchen roll uh, after rinsing it out with some cold water, but I thought I'd just demo this, just so you can see. And plus as well, it gets a more of a sort of a sterilizing effect as well. So I'm gonna keep that going for another half minute, rinse it out, scrape any stuff out that might be there. Then just wipe it dry with a piece of paper kitchen roll and that'll be ready for my next use. Hello dog. Okay, it's getting on for about 10 o'clock, so I'm going to uh, locate myself over to my cooking kitchen and start to knock up stage two, the main course of my Chinese meal. Bash it to the max on the riverbank. So this is where 
the practicality and just the convenience of both of the two burners are going to come in to cook in this next meal where I've got sunflower oil, soy sauce, sesame oil, roasted cashew nuts, a mixture there of chopped up fresh ginger and a clove of garlic. Then here, which will go in last because these cook quite quickly compared to the other vegetables which I'll show you in a moment. But in there is uh, sugar snap peas and chestnut mushrooms already prepped. And here again raw vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, chantonnay carrots and onion. And then we've got the Chinese spicy, bit like hoisin sauce type of spice with five spice powder. Uh, a traditional sort of Chinese spicy, sweet and tangy sliced pork. And then just for convenience, pre-cooked noodles so I don't have to actually boil them up from being dry. All I've got to do is mix them in with a mess tin once everything else is all cooked up. So let's get it on the go. So. I've put in there about, there's about two tablespoons of the sunflower oil and then about just over a teaspoon, say a dessert spoon of the sesame oil, then with the ginger and the garlic and then that sort of infuses into the oil which then tends to flavour whatever you're going to cook within the oil rather than putting the vegetables in the oil then the garlic or whatever seasoning like ginger and the garlic which I've got there so that's going to infuse into the oil but what I don't want it to do is actually to brown so it's just delicately just warming it through without actually sort of cooking the garlic right the way through so to speak Here we go. What you need to do is scratch the screen that you're watching this on. <laughs> scratch and sniff channel. So that's infused into the oil, the ginger and the garlic. Now I've added the harder vegetables. The way I've cut them because I like them in bigger chunks rather than actually slicing them. Because if they're all the same size then I could actually add this in as well. But by the time this cooks through, what I don't want is the sugar snap peas and the mushrooms to get too soft. So these will go in about halfway, but I'll probably put these in that saucepan, because as you can see, that mess tin, could have brought a big frying pan. But that mess tin is just about the right size for the vegetables so far. So that's going to take about about 10-ish minutes to cook through. Letting the heat go through for sort of five ten seconds then stirring it so they don't stick vegetables don't stick to the surface but I've mentioned before this old stainless steel really works out great probably don't get the heat too high yeah smoking it's normally a good idea if you're gonna add the soy sauce is about halfway through cooking because sometimes it can actually burn it onto the surface of whatever, say a wok or, or your mess tin or anything like that. And it just tends to keep the texture a little bit more moist as well. So that's going to be the theme of the flavour. The soy sauce, the garlic, the ginger and then of course the sesame, which is a really nice nutty taste. And then the piece de resistance right at the end is going to be these roast cashew nuts. So as the harder vegetables have reduced through the cooking, Instead of actually using the saucepan and then cooking on a separate ring, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually add the mushrooms and 
sugar snap peas because these are reduced down to half the size and then I can push all that aside to then cook the meat on the far end. Anyway, watch this space. And now back on the heat, I think I'll turn that up a little bit. Stir fries are normally on a high heat to cook all the goodness in. Right. And so that volume is even going to reduce down a little bit more. And then that mess tin is going to be absolutely full by the time I've put the noodles in there. Oh yeah. Yet another Maverick Outdoors five star cuisine people. Get in. So as you can see it's starting to reduce down again. But I just added, I would say about what would be in size, about an egg cup full of water. And then just a spoon of sugar, as I said earlier. Chinese, traditional Chinese will um, use sugar. Monosodium glutamate, I don't like using salt monosodium glutamate. Because there's enough salt within the seasoning of the soy sauce. So that does me. But as you can see that's reducing down now. And plus as well that water just gives it a little bit more sauce without having to make it too strong by adding too much of the soy sauce. If you do notice that some larger chunks of veg are just a little bit harder than some of the smaller bits then sort of when you come across them that bit there, a bit of cauliflower in the spoon there, that was about twice the size so I just halved it with a spoon so everything's going to have the same sort of texture cooked through but without it going all slushy because you want the veg to be sort of have a crisp to them but obviously within Chinese style not too soft. So another little technique you've seen me do before is push the vegetables to sort of one end. I've put the pork in there as you can see it's already pre-sliced into sort of shreddy little strips. Then I'm going to put where the meat is on top of the ring. So the veg is not in the direct heat, it will still stay warm, but I can actually cook this through separately, then eventually mix it all in. So I really want to make sure that pork cooks through. Obviously if it was a much bigger uh, cooking vessel, like a, a mini wok or something, then of course you'd be slushing it around, sort of like tossing the veg about, so it all flicks over and cycles. But obviously when you're using something smaller, like on a trail kit, to fit into your rucksack and things like that, I could have brought um, a frying pan, or even a wok, considering I brought this monstrosity. But uh, I just want to do it via the mess tin, so at least you know that it can something like this can be cooked out on the trail with small cooking utensils. Final stir through for this trail food late night. Well, it ain't a snack, is it? <laughs> it's part two of my five star Chinese wild camp basher to the max out with safari dog Saturday night at 11 o'clock. Scoff time. Cheers. Mm. Meat's tender and tangy. Vegetables, just the right texture. Really nice. Can't think of a better way to spend a Saturday night at 11 o'clock at night, sitting on a riverbank, bashed to the max, eating something that I could have prepped it at home and then just heated it up here. But it's just nice to cook the veg and the meat from fresh. I'm just doing something tactile, cooking some trail food. Mm. Absolutely spot on.
So I've tidied up my kitchen cooking space <laughs> and uh, now ready to have some dessert which is going to be tinned of mandarins. I'll drink some of the uh, juice out of that which then will make space to plaster it with this chocolate custard. <laughs> oh. So it's now coming up to about midnight. The, uh, the night is really still and calm. There's no breeze. There's no real chill factor, although I have actually put my uh, homemade fleece on. Check out the video about three years ago when I featured a vid on how I made it. Yeah, but um, it still is time really well. Worn it loads of times, all weathers, all terrains, and uh, I've also got an army. They were MTP, army issue, lightweight trousers, but I um, actually dyed them, although they're poly cotton, I used a black cold water dye, and um, it made them a little bit darker, so it's less of a sort of military look, a little bit more sort of casual, so... Uh, yeah, they just keep any little chill factor off my legs. Safari dogs are having a chill as well. Just relaxing. As it's the first time we've had a chance to come out since actually the last time I came here to do um, sort of cooking a lunch on the solstice Sunday, which is the 21st of June this year. And since then we haven't been able to go out because a week after the solstice, um, she had a real health problem where she had to have emergency surgery. But she's a tough old boot. A bit like her old man. <laughs> Will never give in. My maxim is never give up unless you're dead. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of just sort of chilled. And it just feels too nice to um, go to sleep right now, even if I could sleep. Just want to savour the outdoors and just the atmosphere and just this lovely little secluded spot, albeit I'm surrounded by stinging nettles <laughs> as my protective fortress barrier. Meanwhile, beyond my boots, out there where the light isn't travelling to see, but I can see it, but the camera's not picking it up, is all the foliage grown out of the little backwater stream and all the silhouettes when it's dark and there's no light. You can see all the silhouettes of the grasses, the reeds. And just the quietness, <laughs> as you just sampled. Chill time. Good morning, it's about nine o'clock. The rain that was forecast for the early hours of the morning kicked in about four or five o'clock for about an hour and a half, so good job I did put the tarp up and not just be tempted to sleep out literally under a clear sky and stars, so because the rain kicked in uh, just as day broke actually. And it wasn't too heavy, but it was a downpour enough to have got wet after about five, ten minutes if you'd have been up under it. So now of course, Ready to start the day. It's a bit breezy, 
Uh, it's quite nice actually, it's fresh, but the um, I think the breeze has actually blown over any any chance of any heavy rain kicking in again. As I say, it's not forecast for today, Sunday, although there might be intermittent showers later on tonight. But just sort of overcast with the odd bit of sunlight um, creeping through now and then. That's what's forecast. then uh, it's going to be quite a nice, mild, outdoorsy day. Safari Dog slept on her folded up fleece blanket with the uh, sleeping bag draped over her, but you can see she's actually crept in <laughs> to be underneath with me, haven't you, Dog? <laughs> yeah. And I just slept in the clothes that I was wearing last night well, before I settled and then just opened up the uh, two season sleeping bag and just draped it over the two of us. And that was really comfortable for the night to sleep in. But it was about three weeks ago now that the um, health scare that I had with Akasha, where she was actually discharging blood from her back end, basically phoned up the vet and they uh, described um, what the symptoms were and they said to get her into the surgery as soon as possible and uh, within 24 hours she was having life-saving surgery uh, caused by pyometra which is um, an infection of the internal certain parts the internal organ whereby some of the internal organs break down and um, start to then go septic and with a natural process of trying the body trying to deal with it there's a discharge of blood but if certain tubes or parts of the body inside get blocked um, the blood can't discharge which in turn means the dog or the animal gets septicemia uh, and within 24 hours they can be dead so um, lucky enough the blood was actually discharging and uh, for me to actually notice it and then get it sorted out So she was in the vets for a couple of days, weren't you dog? And she had the operation, surgery, to her underbelly and they found another ulcerous growth which they weren't sure what it was so it was uh, that was taken out as well. Weren't it dog? And um, was taken for a laboratory test and it was found to be benign, not cancerous, so that was great. So I so say that was three weeks ago, so um, she's near enough been given a a full bill of health. <laughs> Sorry about the physiology and anatomy of dogs but it uh, just explains it a little bit you know. So she lives another day. Don't you dog? And a good few more safari ones to come. So this is the first time I've taken her out hardcore sort of overnight outdoors wild camping and that her usual stuff. Her usual safari stuff. Bit of rehabilitation for her and uh, it's just good to get her out because she's used to being outdoors and adventuring around so all good stuff, eh Gog? Eh? So last night I didn't collapse the two burner stove I still kept it structured and just placed a two metre by one metre folded plastic tarp over it to protect it from the rain and just kept it in the head end part of the basher but in a moment I'll place it where it was yesterday and uh, cook up some breakfast. <laughs> oh yes! Oh, you want some creature comforts, don't you? And I'll give you some breakfast as well. Just gave you a drink out of her little bottle, so she lapped that up. But before I make some breakfast, I'll just show you around the uh, whys and wherefores behind the structure and how I set up the basher. Using four sectional poles, and two of the paddles and then some of the trees that are around me. So I moved the canoe for safety and security around the end and brought it round behind this tree and just mounted it up at a slight angle so that the rain would not fill inside it obviously if it's coming down at that sort of angle. Plus deflated the side chambers so that if it got warm this morning before I was able to get up 
and get to the canoe, the air would have expanded from yesterday. But actually, as it happens, since deflating it before settling last night, it's actually expanded again without me actually pumping any air back into it. Literally to the same pressure as it was when I was paddling on the river yesterday. So it's a good job I deflated it, because if I hadn't and left it as it was, um, it would have expanded even further and maybe put the bladders at risk. And coincidentally, I actually um, explained that the last time I was actually here. But back to this pitch, because I knew I was going to be actually limited for space, and basically along this stretch of the bank, I knew that this was going to be my footprint, so everything had to be based around this floor space. And even if I were to have cleared the nettles, uh, the ground isn't really that conducive to pitch a basher because it's actually sloping down at an angle. So I was actually literally limited to this nice little picturesque view here. Could have done an A shape like that. So going through either access this end or that end, but then of course I'd have had the view cut off from the river, so I wanted it open along that edge. A fixing at either end and one in the middle along the back. And so I could keep the right sort of tension, not overdoing it, but just getting the right alignment, tension and tautness from this five section pole corner, bringing this bit of paracord down. And because the bank was very soft here, I had to get a stick that's about two foot long, I drove that into the ground and then hitch, knot, uh, hitch knotted it, you can see there. I brought eight sections of these extendable poles, but here I've only got five sections, and then the other three I didn't have to use, but this actually makes it a little bit higher than the other end where I've used the paddle. So I've used the paddle on the two diagonals. That was the most practical place to be. I've shown this before, but where the eyelet is, just put a tent peg just through the hole so it marries up, and then as you pull the tautness to keep the structure, it keeps it secure otherwise obviously this has got nowhere to fix and would just fall out and to give me some ridge line center head height you can see I've just bungeed that loop around the tree and also the far end taking the paracord from that corner and you can see going all the way up to the overhang of the white willow and then just bungeed the two hooks into the loop of the paracord and you can see it's just braced into position by the bungee that's looped around the branch and I've just hitch tied this corner end up to here with the same aspect tent peg in there keeps it in situ and then that paddle supports that corner so what was my foot end of the basher I'd have preferred to actually have my head this end because there's less chance of any access from this end compared to my head end where there's an overgrown fisherman's path which actually leads to the field that's just yonder over there. But because the ground was sloping down slightly this way I had to have my head that end. I would have preferred it to be this end because if there's more chance of access coming this direction from any strangers or people then uh, at least I can see straight away. So that's from my own personal point of view, for my own personal safety and security, and just being able to see what's going on, basically. Plus, it's always good to have your head position or your main point of sight and view uh, with any access. And the main access would be down there, as um, some canoeists, a couple of kayakers, have come by today. But then they're going to have to make the trip back down again because it can be blocked off that end, so there's less chance of actually access that end. I fixed the ground sheet on both end corners so it keeps it stable and also on the internal corners but I've also got a little bit of a lip which actually bridges up against the lower edge of the tarp that's on ground level so that sort of just hooks up and just sort of seals it in a little bit more practical. Food bag and sundries, sort of multi-tools, all bits and pieces in there, head torches, lights, what have you cook kits in their <clears throat> food box which virtually had all the food that you've seen me cook so far uh, a dry bag which actually I brought more kit in because I was considering maybe doing a review a separate video on some of my sleep kit so hence that's why I brought that dry bag sleep kit dry bag with some clothes in 
there was another shirt in here which I didn't wear, so I just used that as an extra support, inflatable pillow, put that on top when it was at the head end. Normally I just use this Army Issue 120 centimetre sleep mat, but because of doing the review of some of the kit, I brought this foam mat that I've had crumbs, I've had this for about seven, eight years. And uh, there's a couple of pictures now I'll show you where I've actually used it when I went a bit more hardcore and that's all I use to actually sleep on. And this is the hardcore end, all my tools, gloves, machete, stool, some of the extra bits of fixings for my shelter kit. Camo net if I wanted to go a little bit more stealth, but I didn't really have to use it today. Trench tool. So basically all my kit is all set out and regulated exactly where I know it. And then of course the sleep area is on the outer side where I've got easy access to sort of move in and out without being blocked in by kit, which really isn't necessary. Right, after that little demo I've really built up an appetite, so I'm going to make some breakfast now. <laughs> so I'm all ready to spark up the stove, you can see I've got the toaster there, whereby in this box there's sweet cranberry, date and walnut bread. I've got four slices there to go on the toaster with some hot dogs. Car shall have a few of those, two eggs, oil, tomato sauce, butter, salt and pepper. I've just got the kettle out of that little green bag and you've seen that loads of times before but I've actually put the saucepan back in but I take the lid off, turn the kettle upside down, the kettle goes in there, the lid goes on, kettle saucepan, job done. I've got some fresh Kenyan ground coffee beans in there, two spoonfuls will go in this filter for it to brew through inside this cup but I actually stored fresh milk wrapped in a paper towel just for a little bit of insulation so it doesn't perish fresh milk in that container so bring it on as I said yesterday the beauty of the two rings the double stove is that when I'm cooking in the mess tin on that side, I could be boiling up the cat at the same time. So while that toast is doing nicely, if there was a failure for any reason in this cook unit, then I've got a backup, a folding hexi stove with hexi blocks, and also I've got my fire kit. So if I was desperate, I would have had to have got access somewhere to get some firewood. But say this has been working, so the backup that I would have always with me Fire kit, fire making kit and hexi stove didn't have to be used. Just using a prepper's mindset. Better great outdoors. Just chillax into the max, I'll pass two, quarter to three, Sunday afternoon. The uh, sky has cleared, there's far less cloud than was forecast, so... But I think again that's down to the breeze, it's a bit more breezy than was forecast, so that must be creating high pressure and clearing the clouds, so we've got hardly any clouds in the sky, nice and blue, a bit breezy, and really nice and sunny. So I'm just sitting back on this uh, 100 litre dry bag which I brought far more kit than I needed to uh, sleep kit wise because I was going to do a review but I don't think I've got enough battery power left with the camera so uh, I'm going to leave it for another time so at least um, you know it was just good practice to use the canoe bring a lot of kit coming out for a nice secluded riverbank overnighter 
and for little safari dog to do a little bit of rehab and getting her back into the outdoors and just having a really nice just over 24 hours out in the canoe <laughs> Silly old dog. So the content of this video has really been a bit of a food fest, really. Um, all what I cooked up, I could have easily cooked up at home, but obviously spending the 24 hours outdoors, camping here overnight, just takes it into a totally different realm altogether. So. Yeah, just chilling now for the rest of the afternoon. Being visited by a few swans, floating by majestically. A red kite has been flying about up there, quite a big one as well. And uh, plenty of kingfishers giving their high pitch chirp, bleep before they take flight and then sort of totally go parallel to the surface of the water. Literally just sort of flying by. And especially as well for Akasha Safari camping canoe dog to get a bit of rehab in the great outdoors. Just bring her back to normal with things she likes to do, loves being outdoors. Savouring all the different aromas from wildlife, foliage, nature coming back to life, especially during the summer. All the different aromas, and especially things that really, you really can't get unless you're on the riverbank or on the river waterways. And I went a bit over the top for the first time, <laughs> bringing the Coleman two burner stove. But there you go, I could bring it in the canoe. So Akasha's getting a few vitamin D rays and I'm just going to chill here for about another half hour. Then strike down and uh, have a nice paddle back while the sun is still really warm and it's going to be cascading across the main part of the stretch of the River Thames. So I'm looking forward to that. Give it a chew. Go on. Taste it. Don't swallow it whole. That's better. Why is it dogs chew things that have got no flavour to them, and yet things that are really flavoursome and really yummy, try and swallow it in one whole snatch? Oh well. That's little animal creatures for you. Yes it is. Don't say no. Okay, I struck down the basher, the canoe loaded up with plenty of space for me to sit and cast between my legs. We don't paddle in tandem, but we sit in tandem. <laughs> so she's ready now to go. Got a lot of sun, nice bit of rehab. So it was just a simple 24 hours outdoors, bit of a wild camp, knocking up some food. Lovely weather. It was very mild yesterday, bit of rain early this morning, but now it's really cleared up and it's really turned up for the books. The weather's so much nicer than what was predicted. Sun's cascading. It's going to be virtually much probably behind me as I go back to put in. But it's going to be a lovely reflection on the waters and that lovely effect paddling back. If there's any highlights that um, one's inquiring about or inquisitive about with my kit, um, if you check out, and the reason I'm looking because <laughs> my kit's down there, and I sort of did a, a bit of um, a review what, why, how and where I'd use it within that kit bag. As far as the basis of my kit that I'd take out for wild camping on the rivers in the canoe. And that was featured a little bit more in depth in the previous video to this one, chronological order. The one that I did uh, on sunny solstice. Oh, she's just flopped down in the sun again. 
So this weekend really was for Akasha to rehab and uh, get her on the mend and make her feel normal again. And of course for me to enjoy the outdoors and hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Following my journey, a little bit of um, cooking tutorial yet again. And I always say it doesn't have to be a packet of dry noodles and a stock cube or a bit of tomato sauce, you know. Use your imagination and uh, you can have a much better time outdoors. Just for the event of actually coming out, literally as I have done, 50% of it, the contributing factor, was just to cook and eat outdoors, which was all good stuff. So I hope you deemed some sort of interest or just sort of some general information or just inspiring you to get outdoors, cooking some food, even if it's just sort of packing up a backpack, putting some food in it, and um, when you know the weather's going to be nice, there's nothing better than cooking, eating food outdoors and just savouring nature. And the sound of the breeze, I'm going to be seeing a few more kingfishers I'm quite sure and a load of waterfowl floating by and paddling by. So thanks for watching mine and Akash's little jaunt out in the canoe. Some people have actually sent their well wishes when they actually knew of Akash's condition and the uh, life-saving surgery she had to have. So you know I'm really grateful for that, really humbled by some of the feedback that I've had from people. So I'm going to set off downstream and as always, thanks for watching, really appreciate your interest and catch you in another video soon. Cheers, take care. Come on, guys.